Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Anthony Manna. Dr. Manna is the author of Lucas and the Game of Chance. The book's illustrations were created by Donald Babish. Anthony is an award-winning children's author and retired professor of children's and adult literature, literacy education, and drama from Kent State University. Through his many experiences and through his passion as an award-winning educator of 50 years, Anthony has inspired kids and teens around the world to become confident, skilled, and happily motivated readers and writers. Anthony has taught in schools and universities in Turkey, Greece, Albania, and the United States, where he immersed kids, teens, and young adults in powerful multicultural books and entertaining action-packed activities to help them enjoy the discoveries about themselves and others that great books and their own writing can encourage them to explore. Anthony Manna, Dr. Dr. Anthony, Dr. Tony, all of it. Hey, welcome to the Success Insight Podcast. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm overjoyed to be here. Thank you so much. Well, I am really excited. First and foremost is I love Greece. There's just, ever since I was just a little kid, I've always been fascinated by Greece. And I, I grew up in a suburb of uh, Detroit and around the corner, we had this little diner. The Old Park Diner was owned by a gentleman named Nicholas Lekas. And Nick taught me how to make spanakopita. In the spirit of full disclosure, I don't think I've ever said this to my listeners before, but I have just entered my six decades. I turned 60. Oh my God, I can't believe I just shared that. But I have been making spanakopita probably for over 40 years. And so Greece is just something, it just, it just near and dear to my heart. And so when I was learning about you in the book, I was like, oh my God, I have to, I have to learn more about you and your work. And I, there's a little bit of envy here, by the way. <laughs> uh, so uh, enough about me. Let's talk about you a little bit. How did you get started in, you know, what was this insight, this aha moment that said, you know, I want to get into education and I want, I'm interested in literature. Where did this begin for you? Well, it's a little complex. I mean, I think I think what what happened was I. All right, I'm going to go back to my high school time in New Jersey, and I was graduating at the bottom of my class. I had no idea of how to connect with the world around me, and I was petrified. I didn't want to go into the service. I just didn't. And so what I decided to do was to have a vocation. That sounds really ridiculous, but I went to the priests and I said. I, I want to be a priest. And so that was a very important turning point for me because they sent me off to the upper peninsula of Michigan. I know that. To, well. uh, yeah, yes, Menominee, to a, um, a monast, uh, a, a seminary, first a seminary. And oh my, what an opening that was because they said to me, we're going to show you how to study and use your mind. And I said, oh, okay, well, tell me what I'm supposed to do here. And that's what they did. You know, they, they really, they, they taught me the discipline of the mind. Plus, I was in a community of like-minded men, and it was very supportive, and it was a highlight, you know. And uh, I, left that, I left that seminary to go to a monastery where I was, I mean, we, it was almost complete silence during the days, et cetera. So that was like my firm foundation for helping me to find myself. And I started realizing that I was learning how to read. I was taking ancient Greek and Latin and all, all sorts of disciplines that get your mind muscled. So then when I came to the point of leaving, of deciding that I did not want to spend my entire life you know, as a priest, I went to Seton Hall University in South Orange, New Jersey, and that was another great place for me to go because they wondered to me, because of my abilities, they wondered if I wanted to be an educator. And I thought, no, I, have, I had no idea I wanted to be. What did, tell, me, tell me about this. And so they sent me off into the schools as a kind of apprentice to visit, to see, you know, and um, one of the first schools I went to was in Hoboken. It, no one except the teachers spoke, in, uh, spoke English. I mean, it, all the kids spoke Spanish. And that, you know, I, I thought, well, what do you do here, you know, with these kids? And that, you know, you do a lot of drama and a lot of pantomime, you know, and then that just led me 
to the, I, it was the first summer of um, the Head Start. And I was still in New Jersey and I went there to be an aide and I just fell in love with it. It was to see the dynamic between the teacher, the teacher's aide, that's me, <laughs> and the kids. I mean, it was w- what you could do to support those kids and make them feel good about themselves and the talents and skills that they have just really was a total introduction to me to what I wanted to do in my career. It sounds like you truly went on at least two hero's journeys where you are the hero looking for guidance and where is my place in the world and the first one being this the monastery, the seminary, where you learn the discipline of reading and understanding. And now the second journey is, oh, you want to be a teacher. Okay, we're going to send you to a place that no doubt they need help, but now is a place for you to ask yourself, how can I fit in here? And what is it about this place that is going to inspire me? Yeah, and then uh, I think that that kept happening because I was working on a master's degree, and that was the kind of, it's called an MAT, a Master of Arts in Teaching, and you you spend an entire year in a cl- your classroom as the teacher. And they come in, they, you know, from the university, they come and observe you and critique you, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, that that was a middle school, and those kids are so active and their brains are they're learning so much so fast about everything that they're on acceleration it was hard to get used to that i had to really focus myself i had to learn how to discipline them because they were all over the place and so that was my that was my baptism by fire how did this baptism by fire begin to inform your writing and especially in a multicultural environment, uh, whether it be here in the U.S. or overseas? How did that begin? To- well, well, see, see, I have to explain something. I, my father was a sports journalist. He had a weekly column called Ring, Ring Highlights. He was particularly interested in boxers and training boxers and that kind of thing. And he had a manual typewriter. And every week, I could hear him doing this process. And he often would get up. My father, my father would uh, leave the typewriter for a while. He would go out to the porch and he would be pacing back and forth in Spanish because he was fluent in Spanish, right? So he's pacing back and forth. And this is what he's looking for, the story. And I'm, I'm in awe at the process because once he got a lead, and my mother would say in Italian, he's got a lead which meant, hooray, because now we can have Briar's ice cream. (laughs) And that was the reward for keeping shut and, you know, letting him proceed uh, as he did, you know. And so I just, I don't know, he was like, he was like the first writer that really influenced me. I mean, of course, by that point, I was reading. I, I mean, he gave me the incentive in a sense without ever telling me that he wanted me to be a writer. You know, and so that was my first inclination. But the first article I ever wrote, or the first piece of writing that I I considered seriously, was when I was teaching in Turkey. And I realized that I had some ideas. People kept saying to me, you know, that's a really good idea. You should try to share that with people. And I thought, oh, really? How? You know, so what I did was I wrote an article about using psychedelic music to inform writing. And it got published. And I thought, oh, okay, so this is what's going on here. You know, and then one thing led to another and I started writing, I started experimenting, but I had not really touched story. Although you could probably say all narrative is story. It wasn't much later. What happened was I eventually wound up moving beyond high school and elementary teaching and worked on the PhD. And so there I was at a university and I was faced with the threat called publish or perish. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, oh, yes. And so <laughs> there I was. And my, I remember my department chairperson, he's, he was passed away now, but he, he was a magnificent human being, very supportive. And he said to me, Anthony, every workshop you do, every conversation you have, should be turned into an article. And I thought, oh, please give me a break. But that's that's what they wanted, you know. And so you had to move along, you know, and I was, I, it was all right. I mean, I was, I, I was doing all right with it. It was lots of hours late, late, late at night, you know, because you're, if you're teaching or going to committee meetings during the day. But I don't know if a lot of people know that the, the kind of pressure that's put on a university professor is pretty intense at times. 
I have a, a friend of mine, Dr. Renee Warringer. She turned a PhD in Middle East history from University of Chicago. And when you said Turkey, my my the, from the back of my my neck, my hair is kind of raised up because I love. It's another country that I love. Turkey, the food and the um, what's that? The sweet Turkish delight. Oh my God! Um, <laughs> I digress. I'm by the way, uh, Anthony. I'm all about food. If it isn't about <laughs> podcasting, hey, I'm all about food and cooking. You sound like my Italian family. <laughs> so as you. And I love the advice that your 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 department chair gave you. you know, every conversation is a potential story, an article. And how did you begin to kind of knit these pieces together? And maybe because you are in academia, scholar doing scholarly writing, did, did did the books come natural? How did those start to evolve for you? You mean the children's books? Well, I mean, did you did you start off writing the children's books, or had there been some scholarly books that preceded oh, no, them? No, no, I did. Uh, I did several. Um, well, first of all, I did a lot of chapters in people's books. Okay. And then I did a lot of articles that were published in journals. Okay. But then. I established, and it's actually 36 years ago, which is hard for me to believe. Wow. I established a children's literature, young adult literature, multicultural conference. Ah. So I brought in poets and novelists, et cetera, from every range, you know, going all the way up into the upper, upper teen years, you know, who were, were writing for those, that audience and a lot of picture book writers, et cetera. And so out of that came two academic books, one about illustration and the art of illustration and the other one about the diversity and what these people are are looking for and i would say 10 out of 10 times a lot of them would say when i was growing up i never saw myself in books and so that's what drove them you know into the publishing world to try to see whether or not they could be writers two books came out of that conference and i think early early on this was very odd. Early on, I collaborated with health educators. And because I said, you know, sometimes I said, literature has healing power, you know, and they said, well, tell us about this. And so I started this book called Children's Literature for Health Awareness. And it's long out of print, I think. But I mean, that was my first, that was like in the 80s. That was my first big project because it, the book turned out to be around 400 pages or something. And it was like this e enormous responsibility. But it was interesting because it brought me into the league of the health educators in this country. And what an interesting group of people these are. They were teaching about life and death, what people must do to stay alive. You know, it's interesting. And we are ultimately navigating towards Lucas and the Game of Chance. There's always a method to my madness, Anthony. Oh, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> You're wondering when's it going to get to the book? Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just joking with you. Uh, this idea, though, of literature as a as a healing process for property, it's so very timely to what we're going through today. I mean, I'm not going through it, but I read about parents struggling. Should I keep my kids home? Should I let them go to school? Should I let them go to school two days a week? And I can only imagine what kids are going through both. Well, a lot of it is, it's, to me, is a, it's a mental issue because these kids aren't able to interact, you know, in person, flesh to flesh, with their friends, whether it's playing a game of tag or baseball, basketball, hoops, whatever. And what they're going through today, and I'm wondering, I would love to get your perspective and how this, the, the children's genre, the, the children's book genre, how can that help inform either the, the children themselves or the parents with the children, other educators for on behalf of the children to navigate this pandemic we're going through. So I would love if you're open to that, chatting a little bit about that as well. Is that something you'd be open to chatting about? Yeah, I mean, you're so you're saying you're asking me if I know some where literature could possibly uh, be solace and uh, perhaps give them some insight. Most definitely, yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, I can't believe it was a wonderful question, of course, because it's a question I try to answer myself. And I started searching and I found that there are two things going on here. One is there are books coming out which provide comfort, you know, kind of like putting kids in a boat that's very safe and saying, we're going to be OK. We're going to make it. I, I know you're strong enough. I know you're resilient enough in whatever language you use. 
or whatever manner you use and whatever modeling you use to show that. And the other one, a book that I just picked up from a Chinese writer by the name of Yuno, and she has a book where the kids are dealing with their grandfather. I think it's one child dealing with a grandfather who's passing. He's, he's ill and he's going to die. And so I'm seeing that there are quite a few books that deal with death, children facing death. Now, the interesting thing about this book, and I don't think anybody's ever done this before, I have no idea what the critics are going to say, is that the grandfather is reincarnated. He comes back. And the, I mean, and I think you can use that as a metaphor, you know what I mean, to say, yes, they all come back because they come back through memory. They come back through all the joy that you had. They come back from the love. You know, and I, I just started copying some of these, I mean, looking for some of these because I want to broadcast them on my website, you know, or, or in, in articles and other things that I do with, with my, my, my assistant who's a book marketer. That's what's going on. You know, something just dawned on me as you were describing that is, you know, wanted to include, re doing the reading, including some pieces on your website, but it would be very interesting to bring a group of writers together perhaps even on a podcast. Uh, I'm being a little self-serving here, but it's going through my head and I have to deal with this, uh, mm -hmm. is yeah. coming together to talk collectively about this topic. Because, you know, whether it's here in the U.S., no, ma no matter what city we're in, even other countries, we're all having to deal with anxiety, depression, loss. You know, how do we stay resilient? How do we continue to have hope? And how are these the authors writing in the in the children genre about how to navigate beyond this this pandemic? Well, I mean, every every one of those every term that you just used, you're going to find in the world of children's and young adult literature. You know, it's it's a vast world of such diversity in topic and subject that it's it's so overwhelming. I remember when I went to my advisor at the University of Iowa when I was working on my doctorate. And I said, I want, to sp I want to do some specialization in children's literature. And she said, you have to go to the curriculum lab every day and read 10 to 20 books. Because I really had no idea what was going on. I mean, Alice in Wonderland, it's, you know, all the classics, of course, I heard about and I had read some of them. But to go there and search so that right, right now, as people are concerned about children, and their loneliness and their response to what they're hearing about so many cases and so much death. You know, we have a body of literature, sincere and sensitive in so many ways, even books of poetry that can reveal to them that life is filled with suffering, but it's also filled with joy. And this is how we go about it. Wow. As you have continued to evolve in your writing and you, you have this, this focus now on children's books. And, you know, and again, I, I'm sure I'm only at the tip of the iceberg on, the, on a couple of social sites, the, you know, the orphan, a Cinderella story from Greece, you've got the folk tales from Greece, which by the way, I, I absolutely have to read because I, I mean, it, that would put me right back in Greece, just here reading these folk tales, and now Lucas in the Game of Chance. How did your writing as a children's book author evolve for you? I mean, uh, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge genre. Every, a lot of people are doing it. And what was the, you know, did you have a kind of a, a goal or a path in mind of where you wanted to take your writing in this genre? Well, yeah, I, I see what happened was when the university allowed me to go to Greece, I decided that one of the best ways that I could get to understand Greek culture was to go to a school and find teachers who would allow me to be there however many days a week for however long to be in a school situation. It just so happened that, the, that Aristotle University in Thessaloniki, where I was situated, had an experimental school. And there were, there were two kindergarten teachers who said, yes, please come in. And so I did. And as my, as my Greek, I mean, I never became fluent in Greece, Greek. It's a very difficult language. But as I was starting to hear more vocabulary, I could hear the Greek mythology, you know, 
Zeus is Zeus, you know, and it was it, it was very easy to pick up. I, I realized that they were they were even be, they were being read to, or they themselves would go in and you know they were learning how to read, so they would share books with each other. And I was hearing a lot about Greek mythology. But then all of a sudden, I started hearing about ogres and ogresses, lots of tests of endurance and uh, journeys. And I thought, wait a minute, this is not mythology. This sounds like folklore. This sounds like folk tales. And the woman who was in that same room, Professor Sula Mitakidu, was in that same room. She was doing research there as well. And I said to her, Sula, what are, tell me about these. And she said, this is our long, long history of Greek folk tales, of Greek fairy tales. And I said, oh, I, I want some of these. I want to find out what they're like. Well, that, see, that's what happened. And so as soon as I started reading them, I just, I really loved their economy. I loved the exactness of them. I loved the messages. The characters were fascinating. And so we, Sula joined me. And we both said, let's try to make some of these stories available for English-speaking people. And so it was, it was something else because I went to the folklore library on the campus. Now, this is one of those libraries where they have the ladder that you climb to take it to the upper stacks. <laughs> and, so, and so I'm sitting there with this volume. It's about, it's, it was the heaviest thing I had to pick up, I think, in my life as a book goes. But it was both in Greek and English. So, and so I, I started reading these and I realized that the English was somewhat stifled, you know, I mean, it was very academic. And I thought, how could, what can we do with these stories to retell them in such a way, to reshape them in such a way, uh, to get rid of some of the sexism, to get rid of some of the racism, clean them up in a sense, without losing the integrity of the culture. And that's why Sula Mitakidu, who, you know, was born and raised in Greece, was able to, she helped me. You know, and we, we became the co-authors and it was falling in love with the stories. And uh, I mean, when we sent out the first one, it was so badly written. I mean, now that I think back on it now, I mean, it wasn't badly written. It was just very coarse. And an editor in New York said, there's something in the story that I like, but boy, are you going to have to work hard, you know, because it really it was really very raw. You know, and so uh, Ann Schwartz, uh, who was then at Simon and Schuster, she took us on. That was a mag. She, I feel every. She's in my voice. She's in my my head all the time when I write because she she was she was able to show us how to craft a story. Fantastic. You know, I'm curious as you were describing this journey and this again this encounter with you know the guy, the you know the compatriot uh, Psula. There was a, a part of the notes that that were shared with me, and as I was doing my homework, there was a story you had shared about the train ride. I guess it was six or eight hour train ride from uh, Thessaloniki to Athens. I think, and you're you're obviously going. It's a very long ride. You're going into these local towns, and one thing I was, by the way, I would love to take that trip, but that's again where I digress. Um, if in the stories as they were evolving in these folk tales, did they evolve along the path of this this journey, for example? Because the, the story as it originated, say, uh, in Thessaloniki, and now you're taking this long ride, eight hours, going to these various towns. Did, these, did you find that the stories evolved or did they stay pretty much, you know, spot on with each other? I'm curious. Well, you know, that's such an interesting question, because I think right away, I can tell you that I promised myself when I when I was in at the university, that whenever there were, was a, a vacation day or where there was a long weekend or something, I was going to start going to the antiquities, to the sites, Delphi, you know, and, um, and Athens itself, of course. And I did. I went in winter with heavy clothing on. I went in spring I'm, and I would go. To these sites, you know, and I, most of the time I was the only tourist because, you know, everybody was gone. They were in their homes <laughs> by the potbelly stove or something. But I mean, I was out there and I just took it all in. And I remember just thinking, the cult, this is the culture, you know, and I can pick up on this. And I started incorporating some of that sensitivity, some of those, some of what I was seeing. Uh, and some of the expressions that I was hearing into the stories. There's an expression that comes up quite a lot, which is uh, what, what they'll say, 
Right. So they'll say about a character, well, what did he do? What did he do? That, the, as a narrative question, which I love because it stops you on your track tracks and it says, what did he do? And then it's, well, he, he did this. And that's such a Greek way of thinking in the sense of there, there, there is, there is a path and you are destined to follow that, you know, and, uh, I, I, I love, I loved those attitudes and those, you know, what, I, what I was picking up in, in terms of the philosophy. I think, I think Greek people are very philosophical. Uh, I've always felt that way. They have a lot on their mind about how we, we do all this and stay together. It's a, uh, good philosophy. It's unfortunate they've gone through the economics that they have, but I mean, culturally, it's just wonderful people. I'm curious now as we kind of maybe sh- uh, transition into talking about your la- your latest book, Lucas and the Game of Chance. How did this book evolve for you? Because it, it seems to be picking up a lot of the elements that you've just shared with us. You have, to, not to simplify it, the hero who's about to go on a journey. And how did this story evolve for you? And by the way, this I want to give another shout out to your illustrator, Donald Babbage. That's wonderful illustrations. I mean, very complex illustrations. And this conveys just a lot of imagination. And so tell us about this book. What was the, the insight, the moment that this book is starting to, you know, go from just kind of an idea to now it's starting to be put down on paper? Well, if you if you ever pick up the anthology, which is called Greek Folk Tales, a treasury of delights. I almost couldn't remember the name. Yeah, it's no to, to, Folk Tales from Greece. I just saw it over there on my desk. Folk Tales from Greece, a treasury of delights. There's a story in there called the Snake Tree. It is bizarre, surreal, and the Snake Tree is is dominant, dominant, and I just. I never could get that story out of, and also the relationship between the husband and wife. It's, it's very accusatory. It's very nasty in some ways. And it's all about greed, et cetera. And so I'm, I'm reading this story and I, I couldn't get it out of my mind. And so this is what I did. Rather than going economical, because folk tales and fairy tales are economical. You get in there and they all live happily ever after most of the time. You know, and it's just a very, you know, sometimes you don't even get the names of characters. I mean, it's just the queen, the king, the prince, you know, the princess, whatever. But I decided to take that story, which fascinated me, and I was going to see if I could develop it into a full-fledged fantasy. At the same time that I was doing that, I joined a local writer's group. And uh, and whoever's out there listening to this, I can suggest to you, if you want to be a writer of any integrity, then go to a writer's group because they'll tell you when you are honest, when you're being dishonest, they'll tell you when it makes sense and when it doesn't make sense. And so they helped me very much with Lucas and the game of chance, you know, and I, I mean, now what's happened is the snake tree and I acknowledge it in my acknowledgements at the end of the book kind of disappeared. For some reason, I was just able to follow the, you know, well, I mean, so many writers say this, you you don't know where it's going to go. You really don't. It's just kind of, I, I hate to say it this way, it's not so metaphysical or something, but I mean, they they come to you. And and all of a sudden I had this Lucas, you know, who was uh, such a good kid. And like all good kids, he makes mistakes. And that's the beginning of it, you know. So Lucas evolved, Lucas in the game of chance evolved out of the snake tree. And so what would really be nice if there are teachers out there would be to take the snake tree, which I sometimes do when I visit a school, take the snake tree, talk about it a little bit, read some sections of it, and then say, look what this author did. Do we feel anything from the snake tree in Lucas and the Game of Chance? You know, that would be the, that would be the good question, you know, because it's, I mean, it's, a, it's an exercise as well. And when you take an idea, how you can go with it. How did you envision this book would be consumed? And who first, who's the age range for the book? Some people are in the reviews are saying eight years old and up. I have a tendency. See, Lucas grows, grows older in the story. He marries. Right. Has kids. Yeah. He marries Mm Sarah. They have two beautiful children. 
So he's, he's an older gent. I think that if I were in a university class teaching a course in literature and we were going to do something with folk tales or fairy tales, I would say to these adult students of mine, let's read this story, you know, because what happens to this guy? He grows up and what, where does he go? What does he do? And so I have a, I mean, right now it's being marketed ages eight or nine and up. So I'm thinking, see, I, I, what I did was I took the manuscript when I was working on it. I took it to a middle school. Uh, it's a teacher that I, 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 I taught myself at Kent State, but now she's in her own class and she invites me in. I tested it out with middle school kids and they, they liked it. You know, they, I mean, they were, they were giving me suggestions about how to change things and, you know, what was, what was good and what was not so hot, you know, and that kind of thing, which I liked. So they stayed with me. And the day that was splendid was the day that I was able to take the, the illustrations, the actual original illustrations into that classroom. And I could tell the story with those illustrations leading me on without telling the end because I want them to buy the book or have the book read to them or whatever, you know. So I didn't spoil it. But at the same time, they were fascinated by the illustrations. So so I, I was in the middle school. I think it's probably going to be there. You know, I think some people will take it into the middle school situation. So this perhaps at a, I don't know, cold winter day on a, on a Sunday, Saturday night, you know, mom, dad, or grandparents reading to the children, perhaps maybe at a, a level, because it, it was a, it was a comp to, for me, again, you're, uh, as an adult, it was a complex book because I needed to reread it uh, sections a couple of times just to, you know, keep straight where the story was going. And again, it just could have been the time of day, but as I was reading it, but I could see parents, grandparents reading the over the overarching story to their to their kids grandkids and definitely I could see much like you did in the middle school having a discussion about the book and the story the lessons and Lucas had a very good life he was blessed and then he in a fit of something just made a mistake and then he's on a on a journey of redemption what went into the crafting of the illustrations how did you do you collaborate with uh, with your illustrator and the children's books that I'm used to? I mean, a lot of them can get very complex. Some of them are very simple. This there's a lot going on in these illustrations. And for our listeners, as Anthony's describing these characters who our hero is meeting, I mean, there's there's you have to really look very closely and take the time. It's not something you can just look at an illustration and keep reading. You really have to delve into it and, and, and read the description and say, oh, okay, now I see where this is at. So again, for our readers, you want to pay attention to these uh, illustrations. So back to the question, Anthony, is how do you collaborate with an illustrator to flesh out what your ultimate intent was for this journey the hero's going on? It's a very interesting question. It comes up a lot. When I was working for what I call the big box publishing companies, Random House, Simon & Schuster, I was not allowed to talk to the illustrator. There was absolute separation, you know, and they have their reasons for that, that I don't put down. I mean, it's, they want the book out. It's a profit making idea, you know, and they don't want you to be stopping every five seconds and saying you don't like the illustration or collaborating. This time it was totally different. Donald is a very, very good friend. We live in the same place, and we. I said to him because he he's a, a, f- a fiber artist, and he's been uh, he taught uh, in elementary schools art education for thirty eight years, and so I said, all right, what are we going to do? How do how do we do this? And he said, well, let me read the book first, and then from there, we had extensive discussions about what is this all about. How do you think of this character? What does he look like to you? You know, what do you, you know, so it was, it it became very specific and it was joyful, you know, and I, I, in a a sense, I, I don't know if I could ever go back to the other idea of keep the illustrator away from, (laughs) from the writer, because it's such an important and essential collaboration. And I found that and when 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 I started seeing the illustrations, he you know he he took a couple one one that he didn't use was at the very very beginning because we talk about the place that they live in as a kind of heritage, 
And he started doing that, and it was it was very sketchy, and I really liked it a lot, but he decided not to use it. So there were times, you know, and when I saw the snake evolving, and I have all those early renderings, and um, I thought, oh boy, this is really, this is turning into something really pretty magnificent in terms of the visuals, because he was so spot on in terms of the tension and the joy and the contest that Lu- let Lucas gets himself involved in, you know, it, it was a, a steady collaboration of theme, content, on and on. Very good. Anthony, as your readers are you know, consuming this book, this, in addition to the, 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 the middle school kids who you tested out the material with, you know, show the illustrations, what are your readers saying about this book? Well, they're, I've, they're very positive. You know, you don't know. And so when the reviews started coming in, the published reviews started coming in, I was, I was really surprised because they were all very positive. You know, there were four and five stars. And I thought, oh, somebody likes something here <laughs> because you don't know, you know, as a writer. I mean, at least I don't know. I mean, I'm sure if, if I were at the top of my form at the age of 25 and I was like this prolific writer whipping out these stories every day, you know, and just coming to the top of the school library journal list of the best author of the years, and then I would probably say, oh, yeah, that's me. I know how to do all this stuff, you know. But what, with me, I, I, I didn't know. I, I wondered if people were going to take to it, you know, because it is a little bit odd in that it doesn't seem like a typical children's book. They're saying good things. Uh, Kirkus, which is one of the main review review journals, said something, I think they called it a fascinating story or something like that. So, I mean, they're, and the imagination, I think they're, 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 they're bringing that up, that it's imaginative and that it's enticing in terms of Lucas's dilemma. Okay. You know, I have to ask this question, too, is as I was reading the book and uh, as a coach of adults, young adults in the area of their career, leadership, how to get along. And I'm always looking for quotes that inspire me and how can I make meaning of them to use either for myself, because even as a coach, I sometimes have a limiting belief or I, you know, start to go down the proverbial rabbit hole and I have to bring myself up. And there are three verses from the book that really jumped out at me. And if I may, with your permission, first one was this, the may courage be your compass, may caution be your guide and may good fortune be your reward. Let's talk briefly about that one. Is that where did that come from? Because I, I can, uh, to me, I, that inspires me. Oh, well, that's wonderful to hear. Yeah, that came out of my brain. I mean, I just, I just, <laughs> no, it just appeared to me. And I just, but I, I had, I, I needed to work on that, just like I needed to work on the characters that he meets in the forest. They all, they, they leave him. I mean, as he's leaving them, they leave him with a verse. And it, and it, you know, and it rhymes. And so I worked all oh, that took a lot of work because it never sounded the way I wanted it to sound, you know, and then I had to keep doing it over and over again. I brought it to the writer's group and they would say, Ooh, horrible, you know, or <laughs> yeah, carry on, you know? So, but that particular expression just seemed so appropriate because I could play with it. And, uh, you know, w- when other characters say it, as he as he's as he's, as he's on the road and he's leaving them, they can twist it a little bit each time, and and that's what I really really liked about that. Okay, the second one was I will accept the uncertainty of my fate and move forward with hope. That's right. That's that's when he's waning, isn't that right? After he says, "Should I?" Yeah, he questions it. He goes, "Why don't I just turn back? This is getting too difficult." I can't, I I don't like this, (laughs) you know, and then he realizes, no, he said, no, don't do that. You know, you got to move forward. And yeah, I understand that's, that's stamina. You know, that's the, that's the, the discipline. (laughs) That's what, that's the discipline I was taught and the, you know, the, the courage to move forward. Okay. And the the last one that jumped out and as, as I go back through the book, I'm sure there will be a couple others, but may trust light your way, may courage be your guide, may victory be your reward. Isn't that the uh, Lambros the snake? 
that Lambros the Snake says that to him on that very important time, important time, when uh, Lucas visits Lambros's grave in a time of need. It, it's it that see the thing what I loved about the story as it was evolving was their relationship, the snake and Lucas, you know, and and I did a lot of research on snakes, only to come to find out that in and I say it I think somewhere in the notes. No, I say it right in the story itself that the snake that I portray is non-venomous. And there are non-venomous snakes in Greece. And and they are, they are, I learned that they are also symbols of uh good luck. That they want they the the in the villages they don't mind the snake coming into their apartment or into their house because they bring good luck. That's such a beautiful bond. And it was a, a very moving to me, the writer, to start bringing it together, you know, because they, they just love each other. Very good. Yeah. These, those three verses really uh, jumped out at me and this, and I'm again, I'm always looking for verses that I can share. And if you're familiar with the term memes and you see them on social sites, I mean, you're on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And so I would, I think I would want to find a picture uh, that you could then put those verses on. I think you'll get a, an increased following. You should do. You should do that, Dr. Anthony Mana. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the success the Success Insight podcast, and you know, share your journey with us, and really, and ultimately, to talk about this wonderful book, Lucas and the Game of Chance. If our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where are the best places for them to go? Well, the first would be the website, which is www.anthonymanabooks.com, all lowercase. That's one place. And then I think if I, I, there should be some information if they would go to mascotbooks.com. They have some press releases and that kind of thing there. It's, it's kind of interesting. Then uh, I think at the website, though, uh, what's what's interesting about the website is that there's also a section there which deals with Lucas and the game of chance as a, as a, as te- for teaching you know and for for you know working with kids working with young young people to say you know uh, I, there is a there are pre reading activities and then post reading activities and post reading questions for comprehension but the website is interesting I think because there are a lot there are games and activities all over the place plus. Uh, now there are interviews with authors that are that are there on the pod pod bean pod, you know I'm sure you know pod bean so yeah that's a good way okay fantastic well we will most definitely provide backlinks to the website and to your, your the publishing house and uh, I know you you're probably on some of the other social sites and you know different different uh, readers listeners get to consume their podcasts and materials different ways so we'll provide as many of those backlinks as we can. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure. Our pleasure, Anthony. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the Success Insight podcast, and thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us and chatting about your journey and uh, the book Lucas and the Game of Chance. It's been a joy. Fantastic. All right, folks, we have just been chatting with Dr. Anthony Manna. Anthony is the author of Lucas and the Game of Chance. And once again, the book's illustrations, which are absolutely wonderful, were created by Donald Babish. And really, you know, this is just a wonderful kind of, you know, young middle school age uh, book for, for middle aged kids. And but also a wonderful opportunity for parents and grandparents to read, uh, 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 you know, folk tales, folklore, you know, to their to their children as well. So we hope you uh, enjoyed today's podcast with Anthony, and uh, look forward to sharing this with you out on successinsightpodcast.com. You can also find us on LinkedIn and Facebook on our Success Insight Podcast pages, as well as on YouTube. And as we say every episode, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day. And in uh, this day of the, the COVID life that we are leading and having to navigate around, be safe, take care of yourself, take care of your family, wear your mask, practice social distancing. But again, you know, go out there, read good books, listen, learn, have good conversations. And uh, we do hope we'll see you on the next episode of the Success Insight Podcast. 
Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.